So welcome to bringing source control to the business intelligence world. Uh, my name is Heidi Hastings. I am your presenter today. Uh, if you have any questions, do feel free to just raise your hand. Uh, if I don't notice you wave, wave it around, I'm probably just focusing on something. Um, feel free to ask me throughout the session. If it, if it does take a little while, I might just hold it and we'll talk at the end. But uh, thank you. If you do have a cell phone, please kindly silence it, place it on vibrate or turn it off. If you do need to take a call, just duck out the back of the room and take the call. That's perfectly fine. So you all know about PASS Summit because you're here, but did you know about the other things where you can connect, share, and learn with the PASS community? So they run SQL Saturdays all over the world. They're up to about 920 at this point. Um, so if there's not one that you're aware of, check out the PASS website. If you can attend a Saturday event, they are free. There is the 24 hours of PASS, which is 24 hours of back-to-back -back webinars, so it doesn't matter what time zone you're in. There's a session for you. And don't worry if you miss it, they're usually recorded, so you can catch up later. There's also the uh, PASS marathons, which are a smaller session uh, list, and they're usually based on a particular track. And of course, if you do love this community as much as I do, and you have time available, um, feel free to volunteer. You can volunteer at in-person events, virtual events, um, you name it. I am technically a volunteer today uh, as a presenter. A little bit about me. I am a business intelligence professional, and you're probably noticing my accent. I am from uh, Australia. So I am from South Australia. I work for a state government agency, but I'm not representing them here today. I'm on holiday. So all opinions are my own. Uh, I am an ALM DLM enthusiast. So what that means is application lifecycle management, database lifecycle management. I am a fan of Azure DevOps formerly VSTS, and I am also a regular attendee at tech events all over the world. Session evals, you've got plenty of time, so don't worry. Fill them in between breaks. Please do fill them in. It's really important for speakers and also the event organizers to know how we're going. It's how we get better at what we do. Uh, we want to know the good, the bad, the ugly. It doesn't matter. Any feedback is better than none. And of course, you can win prizes, so there's something in it for you. So why are you here today? A lot of people have said, I've got all these reports. I don't know where they are, what they do. I don't know when they changed over time. Or you want to know, hey, this cube has changed. What's going on with it? If you just look at the deployment, you only see the current state. You don't see over time what changed in that cube. You're also looking at going, I need to identify who made a change in my team. I've got many developers, or I've just got one. You know, I sometimes forget changes I've made myself. Uh, but you want to go in and go, who made the change? You want to look at it and go, I've got more than one developer on a particular piece of work. I want to make that development parallel where I can. Have more than one person on my cube, more than one person doing ETL development in my team. I also want to look at it and go, I don't have source control. Should I be using source control? The default answer to that one should always be yes. But if your current answer is no, that's OK. It's not uncommon. It's not like you're doing anything completely bad unless you don't also have backups. Then consider very strongly backups and source control ASAP, like priority number one. Go for it. And if you've answered yes to any of that, great session to come to because we're going to take you through it. So today we're going to look at why source control is important. We're going to look at the different Visual Studio project types that support source control. And if you're not familiar with them, don't worry. I'm going to go through most of them. And unfortunately, if anyone in the room does Power BI, there, there isn't really a story for Power BI and source control. There are workarounds. And it does work effectively, but it's not as seamless as the other BI products within the Microsoft stack. We're going to take an existing traditional environment and bring that into source control. So that covers off the scenario where you don't have source control, but you want to bring your environment in. And we're going to look about how that can help you collaborate across your team. All good so far? Not, that's good. A few assumptions. I do make assumptions throughout this presentation. So I'm assuming you're aware of the concept of source control at a, at a high level, and you may or may not have access to it, that you've used SQL Server Management Studio, that you have seen that the business intelligence stack within Microsoft covers SSDB, B, uh, SSIS, integration services, analysis services, either multidimensional or tabular. The story is the same. And SSRS. I haven't mentioned Power BI because, as I said earlier, it doesn't cover it. And traditional. So what and the why? Why do we do source control? 
It's basically our backup. It's our story about version management of changes to files. Now, anytime people think about source control, they're thinking about it as an app dev predominantly, but it applies to databases as well. It applies to RDL files. It applies to any file you want version history on. So if I am a DBA and I'm running a series of scripts to set up my environment, those can go into source control. There's no exception to the rule there. You can have any file you want version history on. You, you often notice around the community, it's called version control, it's called source control, it's called revision control. It has a number of names, but at the end of the day, it's versioning of files, any file. If you've got a binary file, however, you can still commit that file to source control, but you can't cleanly diff changes to it. Whereas all the other files, you can. It helps with the who, what, when, and sometimes the why. If you've got a really committed team and they like putting comments, that will tell you the why. But otherwise, you'll just see history of a file over time. That's not going to tell you why, but it's going to tell you the who, so you can go track them down and go, why did you make that change? And by the way, if you can't remember when, here's when you made the change. Um, it doesn't replace your backup, but it does help you with disaster recovery. I've worked with teams where they accidentally deleted a stored procedure in their production environment. They were able to recover it within a few minutes by just going to source control, grabbing a copy, and re-establishing that stored procedure in the environment. I say it doesn't replace backups because it's not tightly coupled to your environment. It doesn't automatically go, you've made a change and now you're backed up in source control. It doesn't do that. It has a human intervention point. Parallel development, more people on one file. If you're deving straight on a server, you can do the same, but you don't get a lot of this audit traceability. Who is source control for? So many people think source control is only for developers. I can tell you right now, it's for everyone. Uh, I work with executive directors who code. They use source control, or I try to uh, strongly nudge them towards source control. Uh, we have project managers who use source control. We have data scientists. We have report developers. You know, even just your infrastructure staff who are setting up your SQL Server with scripts, those scripts that automate deployments without GUIs, those can go in source control. It's one of the newer things, infrastructure as code. And all that means is source controlling your infrastructure automated uh, code files, PowerShell files, you name it. So it is for everyone. No exceptions, no exclusions. It's a very inclusive community, the source control community. So when do we do it? There are two times or two scenarios I like to break it down into, proactive and retrospective. So proactive is when you're starting a new project or a new piece of work, you start source control from the very get-go. You do not need to have a deployed environment to start your source control journey. If you're working on a proof of concept, a prototype, you're just doing some learning on your local development machine, you can put those files in source control. I mean, what's the harm? It's just adding the file in. It's not like you're going to suddenly go deploy it to an environment or you're going to break anything. It's just giving you a recovery point. If your machine suddenly breaks, that's OK. You can go to source control and download the versions of those files. There are other options for source control, like your OneDrive. It has version history. You can use that. But basically, proactive, any new development you're going to start, any project you're going to start within your organization, start with source control at the start. It's a bit like requirements. Put it at the same time frame. Start your requirements. Start your source control journey. Retrospective is where you have existing solutions already deployed to an environment, and you want to bring those into source control. You may have development staff who work directly on servers. You might have had a production issue that resulted in a hotfix to a server, and you then need to take those changes and bring them into your source control. So you can go both ways. I do recommend, however, if you are doing a retrospective approach, that you try and switch to proactive once you've done the initial retrospective. But in some cases, that's not possible. Team adoption takes time. Getting staff on board takes time. So you may do retrospective all the time, but it's better than nothing. Cool. So let's look at today's scenario. As I mentioned earlier, it's going to be a traditional uh, BI scenario. I call it traditional. I didn't want to call it old. Um, but there's many, many BI strategies you can go with. So in this case, I have a database. I have a SSIS solution. I have a SAS multi-dimensional solution. And I have a SSRS. Shall I go with that? Excellent. These 
Next few slides are going to be a little hard to read, but they're magnified on the right-hand side. So you see here, here's my database. I have the Wild World, Wide World Importers Data Warehouse database. So you can see this is a screenshot from Management Studio. We then have our SSIS, which is deployed to a project deployed scenario, so it's an integration services catalog. So that has a daily ETL project solution and a daily OTL package. It is a single package solution. You can do it with more than one, though. This is just a simple example. And then we have the SAS multi-dimensional cube. With that one, you can see we have a number of measure groups. We have the data source views there, and we have the dimensions. And last but not least, SSRS. Don't worry, this is just an example. It's not a real one, but it's the world's ugliest report. It's just something I whipped up one day. And it's deployed onto a 2016 environment. So let's, now we've covered off the basic environment that we want to retrospectively bring into source control. I want to go through the Visual Studio project types that you can work with. So within Visual Studio, you would have noticed you do the new and you do the project. Actually, before I go any further, who's familiar with Visual Studio? OK, good, like 99.9% .9 of the room. This is great. So this is a Visual Studio 2015 screenshot. The story is the same in 2017 and 2019, just the um, options are slightly differently named. So within Visual Studio, if we were to do a new project today, we would see SSDT, which is referred to as database tools. That was introduced quite early on. It was the first of the extensions, and it is our database project. From 2017 and beyond, it is in the base Visual Studio. If you select data as one of the little um, extension ads, it gives you the database project. The SSDT BI in this scenario is the fact that the analysis services, reporting services, and integration services are not covered out of the box. They are separate add-ons. So if you have 2015 Visual Studio, you need to add the BI extension or add-on. And the reason it's listed here separately is because it wasn't changed over to be an extension until 2017. And the other important thing to note when working with Visual Studio is the version to your SQL environment needs to be the same. Not number the same, but the appropriate version of Visual Studio to your SQL Server environment. Up until, I believe, 2017 Visual Studio, which now allows a bit of backward-forward compatibility. But prior to that, if I wanted to do SQL Server 2012 and 2014, I'd be using like a Visual Studio 2015. Now with like Visual Studio 2019, I can go a few versions back. This is what that introduces. Those extensions give me new project types. Unfortunately, they're not all consolidated into the one menu item. So when I do new project and I want to look for BI and DB, the database project is under SQL Server category. The BI or the IS, RS, and AS is under Business Intelligence. And then you'll see in that top screenshot there are more than one option per sort of product SKU. So when I want to do analysis services, I have the option to do a new project from scratch, or I have the option to import from a server, and I have that for both tabular and multidimensional. And the same occurs for SSIS. So let's now go ahead. We'll take that existing environment we saw earlier, which is established on my local machine, and we're going to bring that into Visual Studio projects. Okay. Now, if I do go fast through any of this, just please raise your hand. Find my mouse. Okay. So here we have Visual Studio 2015. Uh, it is light theme. If I switch it to dark theme, oh, thank you. Hang on. Thanks very much. Cool. It is light theme. I would have loved to do dark theme, but when we get later on in the presentation, some of the uh, components are harder to see in dark theme um, from an audience perspective, so we've gone light theme. So here it's a bit busy, but it's just because I'm going to show you the relevant uh, portion. So we're going to do a new project. That's going to loot. The first project I'm going to do is the database project. You, you can do it in any order. I just choose to do it database first. And if you don't have all the components, that's OK. So I'm going to call that the Wide World Importers DW. I'm going to change the solution name to something else. I'm going to call that my business intelligence solution. I'm just going to zoom in so you can see. So this is what we have. Database project. OK. Oh. Of course, I hit escape instead before. <laughs> All right. Cool. All right. 
Now, at this point, I could add the solution to source control as part of creating the project. I'm not going to. I'm going to add it a little bit later. So we're going to do OK. That's then going to create an empty uh, SQL Server database project. When that does load, uh, I'll go into the project settings, and there's one setting I'm going to change before I bring in my environment. So I'm going to right click here on the project, and I'm going to go down to properties. And the reason I'm going to do that is the default way when it brings in all the information from the database, it's going to create a file for every object, but it's not going to include the schema name in the file name. And I like to include the schema name in the file name. So I'm going to change the settings such that the schema is included. So that's one of the options here on the project is to include schema name in the file name. I find that handy in case people are just copying files around or you just need to quickly see. There is better improvements later, but this is just one you do before you import anything. And find the OK button. Save. Right. OK. So now you see I've got my empty project. I'm going to right click and I'm going to select import. This import gives me three options. I can import a DAC pack, I can import a full database, or I can import SQL files. All of those are not data inclusive, so structure only. So when I say database, it's going to go ahead and interrogate basically your information schema, and it's going to go through and get all the different objects within the database, and it's going to create them as a structure within the project. If I say script on SQL files, I can do more than one file. So if you have someone who has 10 files that represent your database, you can take all those files and import them in. It's going to change them into the project format and it's going to include them all in. If there are any import errors, it will indicate those, and it will put them in an ignore file. So we're going to go ahead and import a database, and I'm going to select my connection as my local wide world importers database. I'm going to scroll down. And just to show you the connection details, you can do Windows Auth or SQL. You can import an Azure DB as well. Not DW that I'm aware of, but that's potentially a possibility. And I'm going to go connect. And then a couple of things down the bottom here is what settings we want to apply. So we can import database settings like ANSI nulls and that sort of thing. We can also import logins. One thing I don't do when I do source controlling of business intelligence solutions, I rarely include security. Uh, when I say security, I mean logins, user permissions. I do include database roles that are bespoke or custom but that's the only thing I include. The main reason for that is I often work in environments where the Windows authentication is there, but the domains are different for my different environments. So anytime I diff with my project, it just comes up with all these differences on the security side. So I handle that separately. So here we've got the option of a folder structure, and within that we have none, schema, object type, schema, then object type. The reason I want to point that out is if you're familiar with working with SSMS, SSMS displays your database by object type, then by schema and sort of your alphabetical order. When you're working with database projects, when it refers to folder structure here, it's going to go ahead and create folders for each of the different object types in the way that you want it structured. If you have teams familiar with SSMS, I recommend going object type. If you're often doing sort of your business as usual, your troubleshooting and your uh, solutions are schema based, then do schema and object type, because it makes it faster to navigate your solution. So I'm going to say schema and object type, and I'm going to hit start. Then you'll notice here, I'm just going to watch that go. That's going to go through and interrogate my database, and it's going to start to find all the information. It's going to gather it, and then it's going to create files for it in the background. This goes relatively quickly. So you can see here all the different changes. We've got credentials, we've got logons, we've got audit, and all the different object types are usually right up the top. And we'll hit finish. And now when we look at that project, we've suddenly got a series of folders based on our schema name. If I go in and go to dimensions, I'll now see tables for my dimensional aspects. So every object is created as a .sql file. If I open that table, I'll get two different views a design view, and a T-SQL view. Now, can everyone read that as is, or would you like me to zoom in? As is? OK, good. 
So the top, yeah? Dimensions is a schema in this case. So those folder level items, so your DBO, dimensions, fact, integration, are schemas within my database. That's a great question. So the question was, are those, are, is dimension a schema? In this case, yes. So here you can see I've got all the details about that dimension. I've got the keys, I've got the indexes, I've got any constraints on there, I've got any default values, and I can look at it in either the design view or the T-SQL view, and I can have them split. So it goes user preference. And this is all editable, so I can edit in either screen. So I can go in here and say, you know, I wanna change display name to not have a space. I change it, it's no space. The one thing to note there is when you're working with tables, the indexes and constraints and defaults aren't in a separate file. They're in the same file as the table. So if I look at the T-SQL view and scroll to the bottom, now you can see that, as well as extended properties. Okay. So now that we've got our database and we've got that all structured there cleanly, I'm gonna go undo that change. We can go ahead and add the next one. So we're gonna go right click on solution. We're gonna say add a new project because we wanna add a different project here. We're gonna say new project. And then we're gonna do a business intelligence solution. And I'm gonna say integration services, but I wanna import from the server. So I click the import option. Now, hit OK. The name's not too critical here. So this is your standard import wizard. It's going to now ask me what uh, environment do I want to connect to or do I have a project locally? I'm going to say I'm going to go to the integration services catalog. Mine is locally on my SQL 2016 instance. Then it's going to ask me to browse for the path within the integration services catalog. I only have one project, so that's fairly straightforward. And I say OK. And then I hit next. It's going to go ahead and give me all the details, but I just skip ahead and do import. Past. So as that goes through, that's going to interrogate the SSIS solution and it's going to bring it into individual DTSX packages with the connection managers and everything. If it has any problems, it will come up with a failed hyperlink. You click on that hyperlink, it provides you more detail. So we say close and then we zoom back out. And now we have our integration services project here on the left and we can see we've got our two connection managers and we've got our ETL package. I should be able to turn that. I will load it. It will take a little while because it'll automatically go into online mode, which will try and validate. But it'll give you an idea. So it's the same as if I was to create that package straight out of the box. It's going to go ahead and look the same as a DTSX package would normally. Fairly straightforward here. The one thing here is if you have environments within your SSIS uh, deployment, it's not going to bring those in. It's going to take the deployed settings. So the same way if you built a solution within Visual Studio and you deployed it out, and then you added variables and you changed the configuration, those are only on the server. So this is like your design time information. Yes? It's importing the entire project. Yeah. So the question was, is it importing uh, the project level or just the packages? If you have a project deployment, it will import project through, so all the packages and the project settings. Cool. I'm just going to close that. We're going to come back and we're going to do another project. It's a bit of a um, copy-paste, sort of rinse and repeat type scenario. We do a new project, and we're going to do analysis services multidimensional. And I'm going to import from the server. I will actually rename that one to the wide world when I can spell. Call it cube, and we say OK. And you get another wizard here. So we're going to go through and pick our server environment, which is SQL 2016. And I will get it to load. There we go. Cool. So there we, go. we have our cube. I'm going to say next. This one doesn't give you the um, option to review what you've selected because there are really no settings you're picking other than what you're connecting to. So it's going to go ahead and import all the details about that cube 
And now on the left-hand side, back in my Solution Explorer, I can see the data source views that we saw in Management Studio. I can see the cube itself, and I can see all the different dimensions. And if I load those, it will load them like I am looking at them normally. So now if we look at that side by side with our SSMS environment, and I will connect to the cube so you can see that. Takes a little while. For local host, it takes a long while. But basically, you can see that on the left, it looks very much similar. So if you're familiar with working in SSMS with all your development work for your business intelligence solutions, the transition to working in Visual Studio is not a massive one. Structured very similarly, the only difference is the changes I make in the Visual Studio solution aren't automatically going to that server. So once I've brought the environment into my Visual Studio projects, it is not tightly coupled. If I make a change in the Visual Studio project, it's only making that locally. It's not making it on the server. So that allows me to do development offline effectively, and then I can go ahead and deploy back, or I can diff to the environment. But it means I can have more than one developer with more than one version, and I can also use that project to reestablish another environment. So last but not least, SSRS. And unfortunately, the SSRS story is not um, seamless. So where you have multiple, is, let's say we have a reporting services report server. That report server has a large number of files and folders. The way you want to structure that in Visual Studio is one project per folder. The reason for that is if you're deploying via Visual Studio, it only supports one deployment path. So if later on down the track, when you, you extend your source control journey into your DevOps and you go with continuous build and deploy, you want to have those deployment settings as configurable. So doing it as one project per folder means you can just have the one setting as opposed to trying to toggle them all the time. But with that, it doesn't have the import functionality. So it can't go to a report server and download all the RDL files. There is a saving grace here in that someone has put a solution on CodePlex that goes through, it's a SSIS project that'll go through your reporting services environment and it'll download all the RDLs into a folder structure for you. And once they've done that, you can easily add them into a project. So we go through and do our report services project. And we go here and we'll call that the uh, orders reporting. And we say, okay. And I'll just put that back full screen and close these. So you can see here, we have shared data sources, data sets and reports, but it's very empty and there's no right-click import. It just doesn't exist. So how we do that is we right-click the reports folder and we do add an existing item. And before you do this step, you'll go download the RDL reports locally so that you can just add them in because you can add more than one file. So I've already downloaded my orders report. So I can simply go into here and navigate to that report. So I have my RDL file and I can say add. That will add it into the project. Now, if I double click this, it will look like a nice report. Well, it's quite ugly, but it will open as a report viewer design. If I didn't do a reporting services project type and I tried to open that RDL in Visual Studio, it would look like XML, just XML. So if I was to right click and say view code, if you get this scenario, anytime you open an RDL in Visual Studio, it's because it needs to be in a reporting services project in order for it to understand it correctly. So if you see any developers having this scenario, like, I opened the audio, it looks terrible, I can't edit it. You go, ah, create a project, add it to the project, then open it. Okay, yes? Uh, I tend to, so the question was, do you edit the report in Visual Studio or use the other tools available? Uh, I do most of my work in Visual Studio where I can. Yeah. It's not to say I don't do stuff on the server, but I do it within uh, Visual Studio. But any change I make in Visual Studio from here on is just within the local environment. So now we've got our projects and we've got all of those into 
uh, all our solutions from our server into projects within Visual Studio. And if you did want to do Power BI, the workaround that a lot of people are doing at the moment is within your reporting services project or a basic project, add a miscellaneous folder, add your PBIX files to that, and that way it keeps them together. It doesn't add anything, it just keeps them together. And then you can add that to source control. Or you can simply add the PBIX files to source control, but when you want to work with them, download them, open them in Power BI Desktop and edit. The issue with those is when you're checking in the file and adding it to source control, anytime you change the connection string, it thinks it's a difference. A bit like SSIS, anytime you build an SSIS package, it changes the goods behind the scenes, thinks there's a difference in the file. Technically there is, but we don't want to check that difference in. Okay. All with me so far? Excellent. So now that we've got that, we've got our project, I'm going to go ahead and add it to source control. One of my favorite source controls is Azure DevOps, formerly VSTS. Um, it has two repository styles. TBFC and Git, there is actually a third one, um, but I, I'm not sure any company that's using it other than Microsoft. Um, but with that, it allows you to do source control integration. There are other platforms you can use, SVN, Atlassian's products as well, GitHub, GitLab is another product with a Git integration. There are so many out there. You pick the one that suits you, but for today, I'm gonna use Azure DevOps. So within Azure DevOps, we have the concept of a team project, a project and repositories. So my project is past summit 2019. If I go ahead and select the Git repository, you can see it's empty, there's nothing there. But I wanna add my business intelligence solution to source control. So the first thing I wanna do is copy this for later and come back to the project. I'm gonna load up the Team Explorer pane the Team Explorer is within the IDE, the way that you interact with Azure DevOps. I'm already pre-connected, but I'm gonna change the connection because I want a different project. So go into Connections, do Manage Connections. You'll enter your team project details. In my case, it's hastingvisualstudio.com. I go ahead and select my past summit 2019, which is already selected, and do Connect. And then I'm gonna change the connection, active connection over to that particular team project. All that means is my IDE is now aware of my team project remotely. So now we go back to the Solution Explorer. Wait one thing, I have moved it. Go this way, Solution Explorer. And in the right click menu of a project, or a solution, you can see add to source control. So I'm gonna pick that. That's then gonna make changes to the file. What that's doing is creating a link between the file and Git in this case. So we're gonna go ahead and say yes. And then we'll look at the output window and we'll switch it to Git. Now you notice down the bottom here in the output window what that's done is created a Git repository locally. Now, is anyone here not familiar with Git? One person, okay, that's good, that's okay. So Git is a repository style. The concept of Git is it has a remote repository. In this case, this is the Azure DevOps central remote repository. And then anyone who's using it has a local repository. When you ch make changes, you commit them locally. They are only contained locally at that point. When you want to put them in the central repository, you push the changes up to the central repository, and then that allows it to be pulled down by other developers and integrated. So you work locally, commit locally, and then publish remotely. You can also sync, so where someone else goes in, they make a change, they commit, they publish and push. You can then do a sync, which will pull down their changes, check for any changes you have outgoing, and commit them up to the repository. So effectively it's two, remote and local. So here you can see right down the bottom there is local written here and a commit reference number. So the change I've made of adding that solution to source control has committed to a local repository and given it a commit reference number. The number looks small there, but when you view history it's actually like this long. It's quite fun. So that's one part. 
Then in the Team Explorer, because we want to we want to push that now remotely, because if I go back to the browser and do refresh, it won't be there. There's still nothing there. So now we want to make that repository into the remote environment. So we come back, we say sync. Now it's going to ask, what's the remote repository you want to connect to? I say publish, and I put in the URL I pasted just before. Now when I say publish here, that's going to take my changes, and you can see right up the top, quite quickly it did. It's going to start pushing that whole repository up to the remote one. So now when I refresh, my, old, my entire local environment has been pushed to the remote one. So now my other developers can go pull that down and start working with the same Visual Studio projects I have. So if we expand that out, we can see the different files and structure. So now we have the changes in source control. Yes? So that's a very good question. So the question from the, the lady at the back was, if you had, say, 10 databases on a server, how, what would be the best practice way about constructing that within a Visual Studio environment? Like, would you do multiple projects within the same solution, or would you do them separated out? It's a very good question. It is a it depends scenario. Uh, the way I usually structure my solutions is the way that I'm most likely going to work with them. So if you're a DBA team and you have an instance of 10 databases and you constantly work on all 10, then I would create a solution and contain all 10 within that solution. But it doesn't mean that you can't work with them in isolation. A solution within Visual Studio is simply a container for projects. So if I want to just work on one database versus a different one, I don't have to load them all. I can load just the project file and work with it. When it comes to business intelligence solutions, the best practice is how your team best operates, basically. I will contain the project, uh, the solution to a business project. So if my business project has a new data warehouse with a series of reports, my solution will contain a reports project with those reports, a queue project with the cube if there is one, and a database project with the one or more databases. I'll structure it that way because chances are when I'm working on that project, I'm going to be working on all touch points, or the team I'm working in is all touch points. But at the same time, another scenario is structure your solutions as your server environments look. So if you have a different group of people working on the databases, like DBAs are just the databases, no point putting the BI work in the same solution as the databases because that will just confuse people. So you might have all your reports together in one because you have report developers who focus on that. You might have all your databases in another because you have DBAs that focus on that. If your isolation is at that level, then separate your projects that level. But you can toggle between the two. So you can have one solution file that has all the database projects referenced into it that allow you to load that solution with all the databases. But you can have another solution file that has references to the pro one, one of those databases and then reports, for example. And you can structure it that way. Does that help? Yeah. Okay, excellent. Cool. Great question. Yes? So I'm currently using the CSS flavor. Um, and it feels like I have it set up the same way as the GW flavor. Mm -hmm. But maybe not. So I think I'm working on my stuff locally, and then I'm checking in to go on like source control. So the, the so the question, the statement is that he uses the TFS flavor, which I'm assuming you're referring to the TVFC, um, which is the repository type. And is, it acts really similar to the Git one. Is it sort of the same? Yes. I don't believe the TVFC one is more of a you check out, make changes, check in. It doesn't necessarily have a commit locally first. It is always a commit to the remote, if I remember correctly. Um, yes? The question was, after I check it in, is there a way to run it? Yeah. 
And how do you get it back on the server? Yes, yep, we're going to run through that before. So, uh, excellent. So the question was, uh, now that I've got the, the uh, store procedure or an, an example was a store procedure down in, put it into a Visual Studio project. If I want to make a change to it, how's that look? What's that look like? Let's, look, let's go ahead and do that. So we're going to load up the database into Load the Solution Explorer. We're going to navigate through to our database. So let's say we've got the customer dimension. We're going to add a new field. I want to do a store procedure change, I'll do a table change, but it's the same concept. I'm going to add a country name, and that's going to be varchar50, and I hit save. So now you'll see on the left-hand side, because I do have that source control integration, it's going to detect I made a change to a file that is considered under source control, it makes the little checkbox icon pending in it. That change is only local. I can then go commit that change to the remote repository simply by right-clicking and hitting commit. If I want to know overall, I could change more than one file, how many files I've changed. The bottom right-hand side in the little, oh, boop, in the little task pane, it indicates there's a change. If I click that, it's going to open Team Explorer pane back up and show me the changes that need to be committed. So if I come back out and we click that, we can see that one change. And I can go ahead and compare that change with unmodified. When I do that compare, it is going to be to the local repository, not the remote one. Okay. So I can go ahead and see a side-by-side -side diff. And this is the reason I wanted to show it in light theme, because it's easier to see this. So the right-hand side is the current version I'm working with. The left-hand side is the last committed version. If I want to push that to a server, for example, Visual Studio has something called the schema compare. So I do schema compare. That'll give me a source to target, server to project, project to project, server to server option. So I'm going to go ahead and select the source as my project. And I'm going to say it's my database project. Then I'm going to select the target, and I'm going to put my database that I just pulled all the changes down from. I'm going to turn off comparing the security, even though I haven't made a change, it's just to let you know how you would go about making that. So within the options here, if we go under app scoped, you can untick things like application roles, database roles, permissions, role memberships, and users. Because then it's not going to diff the security aspect that I know changes throughout my environments. Come back and I say compare, it's going to come up with one table change. The customers table will have dimension.custom will have an extra change. So at the moment, like you saw before, the changes are all locally. This compare is going to then tell me what's the difference between this project and the server that I pulled from before. So I can see that change and it'll show it as a side by side. And now if I want to go update that server with my change, I can simply I can hit update if I feel confident enough that, yep. I want that change to go out to the server and I have enough access. Or I can script the change. So it'll create an um, alter table, add column script. In some cases, it will say create the new table, rename it. Depends on what the change is, how it structures it. But it is in SQL command mode, that script. So when you open it, you can see here all the different changes. So I'll scroll through because it likes to do all these extra things because that's the only change I really made, but it does extra. So I can go ahead and open that in any other tooling, well, SSMS and Azure Data Studio September edition onwards, I think it is, has support SQL command mode, so I can go ahead and run that script. I can run it within the editor here, but I'm just gonna go ahead and hit update and say yes, update the target. That's going to give me the little data tools explorer. It'll say, you know, I'm going to generate the script. I'm then going to apply the script. And then I'm going to tell you whether it was successful or not. If it does fail, which it can do, it will come up with the right-hand side of that pane. will say, I can view the script that it ran. If I select view results, it will show the equivalent of the output messages window in SSMS. So if I was to run that script and it failed and I wanted to know why, I can go ahead and select view results. That's going to open up the script itself. And it's also going to open up the window telling me all the different messages. So here I can see altering dimension.customer. So a lot of times, if it does fail, that's a quick way to find out why it failed. 
it might come up and say, look, I've detected that this table contains data. This may be a data loss. Therefore, I've blocked the update. There is a setting, same as SSMS, Visual Studio has a setting where you can turn off block on possible data loss. You know, if I know this change is not going to lose my data, so I can go ahead and turn that off and rerun it, and it will add. There are other things, like it might say duplicate keys identified or duplicate values and the key you're trying to apply. So all the different errors you can simulate will come up here. So that's the way that if I make a change, I can then go apply it to the server. And I can do that on any server I have access to as long as my computer can access to it. So if my fellow developer brings down the changes from source control, they can do the same diff to their local environment and bring across all the development work I've been working on. Sorry? Is there a rollback? Is there a rollback? So the question was, is there a rollback from once you've committed the change? No. Uh, the, the way to roll back there would be to take the previous version out of source control and do the same thing, diff and update. The only problem there is if you've done a data change, you'll have to consider that as a separate process. Um, but there's, if it fails, it rolls back because it's within a transaction. How did I get to this SQL script? So the question was, how did I get to this script? So when I'm doing the schema compare, the little option up the top after I've done a compare, come on. elevator music here, uh, it will come up with the little script option. Oh, I need to make another change. Hang on. Go ahead and undo that. Delete. Save. One thing I didn't point out, um, with source control, don't check in build files. Like, so if you've got a sys solution that generates the IS pack, don't check that in. Check in the raw files, because you can regenerate the IS pack on build. Same way here, if I have published scripts, I don't check them in. Unless I want to have a refactor log of all the different scripts I've run, then I could. But generally, you don't check in things like build files or publish files. So once I'm in, the, to go back to your question, once I'm in compare, this little icon up the top, the little, uh, looks like a note scroll. Um, if I click that, it will generate the script. That's one way to get to the script. If I've already run it, it will come up in the data tools operation pane, which is available from view data tools operations. I think it's in other windows. Yep, here. And then once that's open, you can see all the different operations you've run within that session of Visual Studio. So if I do a bunch of work and I publish, Schema compare, publish again, schema compare, publish again. In this window, I'm going to see all the different times I've run this. So I can go in and say, view the script. I can view the script and the results. I can view it previewed. Um, so I might run it and then go, I've got an offline air gap network. I can USB, copy the script, go to another environment and load it in. Yeah. Yes, at the back. So the question was, is there a list of things that should be ignored when checking into source? Short answer is the community uh, throughout the world has what's called with a Git project. They have the Git ignore file. That file says a whole bunch of extensions that should be ignored. And often when you create that file, it will say, hey, if you're working with Python, select this and we'll pre-define what things you should ignore. There is ones for Visual Studio. Uh, I don't think. It may or may not. I'm so used to editing it sometimes. We'll have a look. So this is an example of a getting nor file. And I think it's right down the bottom. So does it do the BI? There we go. So it does automatically things like the SQL Server backup files and that. But in general, if the file is created from a build process, so .ispack, then that file should be ignored if it's not the original source one. So add that in. If it's things like database uh, projects when you do builds, the DAC pack backpack files, don't check those in, especially backpack back, back files because that's your data. You don't want that checked in. I mean, you can if it's static data and you want a version control, but avoid. Um, and then RDLs don't have, they don't have a bundled up build file. So and Power BI is still the same. PBIX is fine to check that in. Yeah. But great question. 
Right, so now we've got that, we've got our project. So we've talked about the fact that we can make, oh, sorry, question? It will, if you, so the question was, if you wanted to roll back that change, and in this case it's an add column, and you checked out the previous version from history, and then you did the compare, and it, not, it would indicate that there needs to be a dropped column, will it create the dropped column statement for you, or do you need to create it yourself? It will create it for you. So we can go ahead and, and do that. So if we go in here, we can see that we're removing the customer column. We go ahead and generate the script. And because we have no data, it should be quite easy. It should have loaded that as published to. You'll notice it creates these uh, .publish.sql files. That's how you know it's generated from a schema compare. So the .to is because it's the second one. I'm going to scroll down. And we'll see here. I'll do an add. No, we'll not add. Remove. Let's try it again. Add. Oh, back to front. I did have it the right way. From the project to the server, update. Oh, that's running. Yep, I did remove it there, cool. Update. Mm -hmm. Odd. So it should have automatically opened up a script that has a drop table, but it's not opening up the script file for me or giving me the change. There we go. I think what was happening there was because I had the block on possible data loss selected, it was not going to generate the script because the only change was one that could be a data loss one. Um, so all I did was went into settings and then on that first screen changed the block on possible data loss and turned that off uh, because I'm okay with the risk. You will find that those settings though are only applicable to that schema compare uh, session. So if I go and go to another one and do it. It's not like SMS where you change the setting and it applies to all. Here I'm only changing it for that one compare. And then we have a look at that script. And we can see here, alter table drop, drop column. Yeah. And you can go ahead and modify that script. You can use the schema compare to create the base script, but if you've got data changes that need to go with a release of changes as well, just go and edit the script, make the change and run it that way. So. Uh, if anyone's familiar with like um, entity framework doing code first deployments where it's up down scripts, you can kind of treat it the same way. So you can have it create the script, then you go edit it and apply any business process work you need to do. You might need to go in and go, I'm going to set all the uh, settings to inactive, then I'm going to make the change for that table, then I'm going to go back in and make some more data cleanup. You don't have to just run it the way it designs it because sometimes the way it generates the changes are not suitable to you. It does take into account dependencies. So if I'm changing a store procedure that relies on the change to a table, it'll make sure the table changes first and then the store procedure change. But very good. And in the same way, if I was to make a change back on the other side and I have, I want to call it a rogue developer, but it's not a rogue developer. It's just someone who goes and makes a change on the server directly. So if we go into that same customer table and we'll go ahead and we'll go design and we'll change it directly on the server, the local server that I'm working with. So you know, it had, let's call it the subcategory. We'll add subcategory in here and we'll do it bar char 50. We'll say save. That's now made the change directly on the server. That's okay because I can flip this schema compare back to front that's then going to compare the server environment with my database project. And in the same way, I can do update and update the server. I can do update and update the database project. So this is how you can continually get your retrospective changes applied. I have had to do this before. I've worked with teams where they always update on the server. So every day I would just pop in, do a schema compare, update, check it in the source control. So I always had a state of what was going on. So we can go ahead and update that. It will say update the target, yes. And then it's gonna modify my files for me, yes. Because I've already got that one open. And if I come back over to the customer, 
we can see it's introduced subcategory, but again, that's only here. It's not within source control. So we can go ahead, look at the differences, see there's two, and go ahead and make a change. And we'll say adding the subcategory for next release. And this is how you get the why. You get the why through a commit comment. And as Troy Hunt has in his, there's a reference I have at the end of my slide deck from Troy Hunt. It's the 10 commandments to good source control. And I think it's about item five or six. It's like enter comments as if you're being chased by an ax murderer. Because um, you don't want your colleagues hunting you down and going, hi, why did you make this change? And I don't know about you, but I can't remember a lot of the last three days of this epic conference. Uh, but source control will tell me all the changes I made. So if I put a nice why, my colleagues don't have to bug me at all. They can see that. And the same way, if you take on an environment that's already under source control, how nice is it to see all that history so that when you go to do the next release or you have a production issue, someone goes, hey, why isn't this report working? You can come in and see the changes and go, oh no, that change was introduced in release seven, it was for this business reason, and that's why. And then, then they sort of leave you alone. So go ahead and commit that change. And again, it's only made the change locally. So we want to go in and we want to sync it or push, pull, sync in this case would be fine. And now if I go back to the browser and I do refresh and I look at that again, and do it high level, I look at history, I can now see all the changes that have been made remotely. So I can see that I added the subcategory for the next release. And if I want to see the difference between that and the previous, really, previous file change, I can go select that and it's going to give me a side-by-side -side diff of each file. So I can even see all the files included in a particular change. And the thing with source control, it's commit early, commit often. Don't feel like you have to wait till the end of the day to commit changes. Commit them as you need to, as you do them. There is no right or wrong way to do it. Uh, the only thing is when you do commit, make sure it builds. Because you don't want to commit something that doesn't build. Or if it doesn't build and it's the end of the day and you're just doing a backup, you can stage the changes or put in your comments that, by the way, team, this build has an issue. And then come back and fix it the next time. So that's how you can see your history in both tools. You can see the history remotely. You can see the history locally. If I go back into Visual Studio and I look at that server explorer, solution explorer, sorry, if I want to see what changed with that customer table over time, before, if I was only managing on the server, does anyone know how I could look at the history of a column over time, uh, a table over time? Pretty much searching through all the transaction logs, uh, diffing all the backups. Who wants to do that when I can just right click and I can say view history? And now that's showing me the local history and I can also see the remote history. So now I don't have to guess when a change was made, who made it. I can see the change. I can see the history over time. In the same way, if you're working with a report that interacts with a cube and suddenly that report fails, if both the report and the cube are under source control, I can go look at what changed on the cube, I can go look at what changed on the report, and it might just be there was a disconnection between a change that was made and all the updates that need to occur. And, or it might be, okay, tomorrow the display name is going to get changed within this table. What are all the things that use display name? So because I've got them all in the one solution, and to your question earlier about best practices for structuring, there are multiple ways to search across solutions. You know, you can grep your server environment, defer all your files, search information schema. But I can also do control shift F. That'll open up the find window and I can say, let's put uh, display name, because that is in there. I can search within the project or across all the projects. So I can say, find that within all solutions. And straight away, I can see there are two tables that have a display name. And if I click them, it'll go straight to that file and open it up. So now if I want to see where something is used throughout my entire BI solution, if it is named consistently, I can just go in and search and then double click and load. If I wanted to do that same thing in a server environment, sure, I might be able to search the database quite easily with information schema, 
but then do you really want to apply that for a SAS cube and try and search through the DMVs there, and then search through the report server database for the RDL, and then find where it's used. Here I can see where it's used. And because it gives you that line of within the file, you get an indication of how and why it's used. Cool. Excellent. So we've made changes. So that helps you see how you can add a solution to source control. It helps you see how you can make changes, how you can then deploy those changes to a server environment, how you can take the server environment and bring it back in retrospectively from time to time. There is an analysis services cube compare. It is a third party product. It is not within the tool. So the tooling is really good with the database projects, not as good with the others, but not completely um, bad. For sure. So the question was, uh, I talked about earlier having a reference to another project within another solution. How does that look? What is, can I show an example of that? So in this case, I have the four projects referenced in this one solution file. If I was to look at the code behind that solution file, so I'm just going to open the file and I'll just open it in Notepad. So you can see what this kind of looks like behind the scenes. Notepad++ does not appear in my list. I'll just open MVS code. So here within a solution file, you don't often open these up, I'm just showing it for reference. It has four, the four projects referenced and the location where those projects are. So the projects stand on their own and the solution is a container to view those projects within the tooling. So if I come back out, if I wanted to look at a different one, I can just right click and say add existing project, find the project on my computer, so let's load, yeah, SQL Saturday Perth is fine and we'll load that project file in, and now I have another project. So that's how you can view the project within different solutions, is to simply add an existing and pull that in. So I can use that solution file as like a viewpoint for a series of projects, because I can load that in isolation. If I go to that same project, oops, and load Visual Studio clean, Give it a minute while it loads. So I'm going to say open existing project. Perth, and we'll load the same one. And this will have a one solution, one project. So if I put those side by side, I'll be a bit busy on the screen. I'll just close these down. Do, 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 do. Close, close, close. So now you can see it's the same project that's being used in both. It's just reference pointers. Does that make sense? So you yeah, so the question was, if you, change, if you have a project referenced in multiple solutions within Visual Studio, if you change the isolated one, if I change the one on the right here, Will it be reflected in the one on the left? The answer is yes. So I can go in and make a change to the one on the right, and it will, because it's using the same location behind the scenes, it's a reference pointer, it will pick that up. So for example, if you had a file open already, if I had a file open in the left, open the same file in the right and made a change, when I come back to the left one, it will likely pop up with a dialog that says, this change has been modified outside this editor, do you want to open it? or discard or save over the top. Because all it is is saying, hey, this solution is referencing that project over there. And I can put the projects in different locations. I can have them in different source control repositories as well. Oh, great question. Cool. So I'm just going to come back to the slides. Because there are other things I want to show, but I want to make sure we finish off the slides. So in terms of talking about that particular example and how we would do parallel development, I could be another developer and go in now and take that repository and clone it locally. Clone is a git command to copy to a local repository and then go make changes on that. So I could act like the other developer, make a change, 
the same way because I can view the repository through a browser, I can go into Teamix, the uh, Azure DevOps portal and go in and make a change to that same file and then when I pull that back down, it will be reflected in my local repository. So I'll quickly show you that so you can see what that looks like because that's another way you can work with parallel teams. So I might go, oh, I forgot to make a change. I don't want to load Visual Studio. That's a lot of effort. I'll come back to the repository. I'll navigate to the files. I'll go into my database. I go through, let's change a fact table because that's kind of fun. Go into orders. I simply click edit and that will treat it like a browser without, uh, an editor without IntelliSense. I'll go in and say, we now need the customer key. Or customer ID because we already have a key. And we'll say that that's an int. Only thing to be aware of, no, no IntelliSense, so if you edit it wrong, you edit it wrong. Oops. And then you say commit, and it'll pop up with the, the uh, commit message window, same as before. So I'm going to say we're adding customer ID uh, ready for fiscal year new reporting. And we say commit. And then if I come back to my IDE, and I go to the Team Explorer window again, I do sync, or I can do pull. So yes. That's then going to update my local one. And now if I come back and look at that same file. So we did fact, oops. Fact, tables, orders, and AC, customer ID. This is pretty easy to see how this went. Customer ID has been reflected. So that's sort of that way. You don't all have to use the same tools either. I just choose to use Visual Studio because I really like it. But I can edit that in Notepad, in Browser, in Azure Data Studio, direct on the server and compare it in. The one time you do want to stick within the project is if you're adding new objects because you want to add them in to the project so it has a reference to it. But yeah, cool. And we can see on the history again, we'll see all the changes. And we can go ahead and diff those. We can diff across more than one version. That's the other thing to be aware of. Once it's in source control and you're checking in over time, you don't have to diff from the latest version to the current version. You might want to diff like five changes back and see what changed over that time. You might be working on a sprint and you've got two weeks worth of effort going on and you want to see what happened at the start of the sprint versus what's happening at the end. And so you can diff between that range. Um, and you can pick which one you're diffing. Let's have a look here. Cool. Do, 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 do. So you see, we now have our solution in source control. So just to recap on that, we looked at why source control is important. And don't worry if you're not already doing it. There are people who are not already doing it. So it's not, it's not, not a problem. Um, but it's great that you're here learning it today so that you can look to incorporate it in. So we went through the different project types within Visual Studio that will support that journey. We looked at how to take an existing environment and bring that in. And then we looked at a little bit of how to facilitate parallel deployment. So where to from here? As we covered off, the changes are all locally. So it's not to say you can't do changes remotely. It's not to say you don't want to do them. It's just to indicate that they are local so you realize that there's a differentiator there. So I can go and make changes locally. I can deploy them. My deployment path or my release pipeline from that point is whatever is suitable for my team. If I'm doing an entire sprint before I release to an environment, that's fine. I do the whole sprint, check it all into source control, and then deploy as a released bundle. If you have a separate configuration manager within your team, they can go ahead and download the latest version from source control, do the build, that becomes your release, and they go release it out. If you're on the more mature DevOps scale, you can then take it to the CI CD arena and go, I'm going to do continuous build and deploy and have pipelines that handle this all automatically for me. So I showed you how you would manually make a change and manually publish that change to an environment. With CI CD, you take that change, all those commits, you have an automation process that does the build and it does the release. And there's some great sessions this afternoon that'll cover off that part of the journey. So we also looked at how you can revert a change. Uh, I reverted it one way. The other option is within source control, I might have committed the wrong file change. 
So I didn't show that. I might try and show that briefly uh, in a minute. But you can basically go in and go, that change set that was made, uh-oh, wrong one. Click it, revert. It will take the previous version and it'll check it in over the top and you'll get another version history. So you can do that. You can revert in source control and you can revert manually on your environment. So the other thing is to look at um, concept of branching. I didn't cover it today. It can be quite complicated. Uh, the Microsoft has some really good documentation on different branching strategies that you might want to adopt. In the Git community, there is a lot of different guidance on that, and I've got some links at the end. Uh, in fact, when I printed the branching strategy guidance that Microsoft ALM ranges had, which is a combination of Microsoft people and industry people, it's about an inch thick <laughs> because it can get that complicated. Um, but it's really worth looking at. If you're doing parallel releases, if you're doing feature releases, if you're doing hot fixes and service uh, fixes, or you're just doing new project work and you need to keep your developers' uh, work separated out because you're not sure who's going to release when, um, branching is what you want to look at. So I will come back to that slide. So this is for further information. The example solutions I used on my local server are available from the website there. You've got things about how to use source control for anyone that's new to it. This gives you a high level overview. Troy Hunt's Ten Commandments. Totally recommend that for any new team looking to do source control. And for those of you taking pictures, uh, just to let you know, the slide decks are all going to be available. Um, so you, you'll get a copy. Uh, the other one is the data tools that we talked about. Visual Studio 2017 and beyond, data tools is included. If you want the BI solutions, they're extensions. You can get them through the tools, extensions, and management. Search for the different names. It will come up with the three different versions. And then, of course, database projects and more details on that, because I only showed you how to import in a database and work with it. If you're doing things like CLRs, that has a, a way to do that within a database project. If you're doing a database that has three-part naming, to another database, there is a way to handle that as well. And within those database projects, it's got the IntelliSense, it's doing static code analysis, so it's checking if you change the name of an object and you referenced it in another one, like say I had a view of customers and I went and changed the customer table to be something else, it will error on build. So I know straight away I've broken something without even deploying it. This is the guidance on the branching strategies and information specifically to Git. Git and TVSC operate slightly differently, so do, do have a look at those. And of course, thank you for coming. Um, does anyone have any more questions? No? Yes? Oh, yeah. Sure, so the question was when you make a change to a SSIS project or solution and that contains passwords saved in connection managers that you have to change the setting to save the password. The, when you do a new SSIS project or package, specifically a package, there is the, by default, it'll say save user, uh, it's the, encrypt with user key. I always change that, always. Um, I never say user key because then what happens is when you go to another computer and you open it up for all your other colleagues, it will error. I always do one of the other options like uh, save with a password and I enter a password and then I securely inform the rest of the team of that password. Or I don't use, uh, I'd say don't save sensitive and I do all my connection manager configurations on the server using environment variables. And when I'm developing locally, I enter it in each time. Because that way, it's securing the information because this, usually the password is for the environment I'm on. So I do it that way. And that setting is both at the project level and at the package level. So make sure that they're consistent. Because if you change a project to say don't save sensitive and you leave the package as save, it'll, when you try and build, it'll error saying, you have a package that doesn't follow the same setting as your project. Please consider reviewing this. Oh, yeah, but good question. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, yes. Hi. So 
So the question was, is there a way to simplify the comparison of SSIS uh, files when you make a change? So SSIS is XML based, so the diff will show up the differences. There isn't really a nice way to say this bit of the GUI changed, this bit of the GUI changed. Uh, the easiest way I've found to do it, I'm okay with reading XML, so I'm, I look at the map explorer to just navigate straight to the changes and read them. But then if you want, you use the commit comments to provide more details, like I changed data flow task with this. The other thing is to use the naming conventions on your object, so Jamie Thompson has a great blog on that that talks about if you're using data flow tasks, use DFT blah. So then when someone's looking at the XML code, they'll see the top element is DFT and the name. Straight away they know you've modified a data flow task. So that's a way, but no, there's not a nice GUI diff. The diff is the XML diff. That's an excellent idea. Putting the putting the so the statement there was put the comments with the change. So when you're doing a PR peer review, when you're doing a peer review, you can go ahead and navigate to that change, helping your colleagues, which is a great way to keep your colleagues on site. Yeah, cool. Well, thank you very much for coming. If you've got any questions, feel free to ask me around the day. Appreciate it. Oh, by the way, at the end of this slide deck, there's screenshots for all the demos, so you can run through them. <laughs>